watch the Facebook. Okay. Hi, welcome. We are live after a couple of technical difficulties. <laughs> So glad that worked out. This is uh, the first Facebook live via Zoom interview for the Rundle Patriot. My name is Vicki Bruce. I'm the publisher and producer of the Arundel Patriot Media Group. We're out of Anne Arundel County. And I am really excited to be able to do this tonight. This is my first in interview um, this way. And with somebody who is really, really special to me and I think really important to this time in this county. And um, the reason I invited Dr. Ellie Gomez to talk to you tonight was because I feel personally, and I know a lot of people that I know feel so inundated with information about COVID-19 and the coronavirus. And there's so many times when I wanna reach out and ask a professional and it's almost like we've lost access, you know, and, but uh, Ellie's a local activist and doctor and emergency physician. And I'm gonna read you a bit of his bio real quick cause it's super long. I'll just read the top part um, to give you an idea of like his background. And he's so generous with sharing information. And I just wanna say, thank you for being here, Ellie, Dr. Ellie thank Gomez. You. Thank you for all of that already. So um, Dr. Gomez is an ABEM boarded emergency physician with leadership experience as medical director, clinician, educator, and health policy consultant. He's an advocate for equitable, economically sustainable healthcare delivery. He's a contributor to academic research on fiscally prudent approaches to eliminating healthcare disparities while improving outcomes and quality. He's an advisor to public health related governments, affairs at the city, county and federal levels. And he's an advocate for ethical clinical business practices in medicine as a member of the board of directors of American Academy of Emergency Medicine. Uh, he went, he has a MPH candidate at JHU Bloomberg School of Public Health. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Gomez. Thanks for the intro. And we should start off by saying that you uh, are multiply uh, talented uh, director, writer, author, and uh, you know I really appreciate all your knowledge a lot. And, and for the record, you know we're usually Vicky and Ellie. So yeah. So if I slip and don't call you Dr. Gomez, <laughs> right. because... I have to say I, I want to keep it credible. So we'll use a Dr. Gomez for the purposes of this. But... Okay. So Dr. Gomez. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask you a few questions in the format of our discussion tonight is it will be me asking questions, a few questions that you know we've talked about things before. And then I'm gonna open it up and we're going to take questions from our viewers. Now, there's a one minute delay. So if you're yelling questions and you wonder why we're not paying attention to you, it's well, either there's too many questions, which would be really cool because a lot of people would be watching or we haven't seen it yet because we can't watch Facebook live at the same time we're on Zoom because there's a delay. I just learned that today. So if you're gonna do that, that's a tip for you. Um, so like I said earlier, the reason that I really wanted to have Ellie on is I think it's really important to like sift through all the noise. So, you know, first of all, this came out of the blue for me. What is, what's the name? What's behind the name COVID-19? So I've heard a lot of ridiculous explanations for the name. Um, the the name it's pretty simple actually. Um, uh, COVID nineteen is short for Corona virus, and um, the way it was identified, or the time in which it was identified, um, was in twenty nineteen. That's that's as that's as uh, elaborate an explanation as you need. Um, so it was originally coronavirus 2019. It was originally part of the confusion. It was originally referred to as 2019 novel coronavirus, and that's because scientists are not the most creative people. They're not marketers. Um, it's not a kind of you know uh, drop the mic name. It's not uh, you know pork daddy 19 or something. It's it's the name that the World Health um, Organization saw fit to. Uh, keep it simple with. 
Um, and it, the more the more complete and, and precise name, it's actually SARS-CoV-2. And the reason is because you might have heard that there was already a SARS-CoV-1. So the the, the virus um, SARS-CoV-1 in twenty uh, in two thousand and two um, caused horrible uh, pneumonia, and uh, that was the first um, SARS. Okay, that's great. And I want to say that we have viewers according to our uh, administrator, who is Yasmin Jamison. I want to thank her for being on the call as well. She's been a huge help to the Arundel Patriot, and she'll be fielding questions for us. Um, I want to also ask any viewers out there to please share this to their own Facebook pages. Um, it's really important that we get the word out, and then this will be archived later, but we'd love to have a live audience as well. So, now we know where the name came from, but what is a coronavirus? I've seen all these cute little pictures. They look like Muppets, you know, and they make mm -hmm. them all colorful, but it's a yeah. really scary thing. And why, what, what is it? So, you know, hundreds of viruses cause common cold. It turns out that coronavirus is just one of those viruses that can cause a common cold. There are many, many um, genetic subtypes. There's three that cause three coronavirus that cause a common cold. The reason why it's called coronavirus is because the outside of the virus has little protein spheres under a microscope that look like a, a crown. And uh, a crown in Spanish or Latin is corona. Um, there have been other uh, coronaviruses that you might've heard of. The SARS that I mentioned, there's also MERS, which is Mediterranean, um, or sorry, Middle East. Um, uh, coronavirus, and that caused MERS in 2012 and caused a lot of deaths. Part of the reason why those incidents of coronavirus didn't kill more people, didn't cause more disease, is because they were really aggressive, and um, the carriers uh, pretty much died right away or, or needed to be quarantined right away, whereas coronavirus can have a lot more indolent course, a lot more uh, subtle course, and can cause sort of lesser um, aggressive uh, condition in younger people, especially. And so younger people tend to carry it around, whereas older people that are more susceptible tend to get sick and then tend to carry you and die. Which is really scary. And, um, you know, one of the things that has scared me the most is the idea, and I, my heart just is breaking for people who've lost loved ones that have gone into the hospital never to be with their loved ones again. And you know, this is just, I think that's just one of the things that is so terrifying about this disease. Yeah. Yeah. I should mention too that um, those other outbreaks were much more like epidemics than pandemics. The difference being that epidemics are more local and maybe confined to a country, whereas epidemic pandemics spread uh, beyond a country, maybe to a continent and uh, maybe around the world like this, this one did. And it seems like uh, quick. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm sure by now everybody knows it's carried when you cough or sneeze. Um, there are particles, and then what I'm doing um, is also a risk factor, which is we touch our faces, especially our noses, um, and um, after touching a surface that may have what's called a fomite, and that's basically just you know dried boogers, <laughs> is is how you get it onto your face. And, and you end up with, uh, with effects unless you wash your hands a lot. And um, by the way, wearing a mask below your nose doesn't really help. In case anybody out there has a kind of a style issue with, with wearing masks. Um, and understand that the mask is there mostly to keep you from transmitting the disease, unless it's a specific type of mask um, that um, filters out small viral particles. Um, you are not protected, but you're protecting other people from spreading it should you have it be a carrier. Yeah, I do. I see a lot of that. A lot of, uh, and I, myself, I was actually doing a live stream recently. And when I looked at the comments later, people were saying, stop touching your mask. You know, you don't even really realize it, but it's uncomfortable and you're tweaking it. And, you know, I, but apparently there's a protocol for taking it on and off, which I learned from my 16 year old, you know, that a lot of us don't know. So even though we were told to wear masks, we don't really even have the 
those skills, you know, I, I feel like that's just one level of unpreparedness that we've been. Um, so we have a question. I'm going to take questions all the way through this. So everybody in the audience, please don't hesitate, ask questions along the way, and we'll be answering questions along the way. Um, but let me read this question here. The question is, I keep hearing about a potential resurgence or outbreak of COVID-19 expected in the fall. What can we look for? What can we, what can we look for, excuse me, uh, to know if we need to self-isolate again in our communities? Yeah, so that seems like a straightforward question, um, but it's actually pretty complicated. So part of the part of the explanation for it is that we have seven and a half billion human beings on Earth. Um, about three million have been affected or um, known to be um, test positive for uh, coronavirus. What that means is that. Um, probably there are a lot more people out there that are carrying the virus and are not particularly symptomatic. So those people are, um, you know, possible conduits to future people getting infected or passing it on to other people who will then pass it on to other people that will then manifest the disease. And uh, we tend to see waves of um, uh, in spe specifically viral illnesses like influenza we see them seasonally. And the reason why we see them seasonally isn't uh, as, you know, some politicians have hypothesized that the weather gets warmer and it kills the bug and um, other such nonsense. Basically what, what occurs is the, the virus doesn't survive as well in warmer weather. One, because we're not packed into tight spaces and transmitting it between one another. Um, so we're in, in summer, we're less likely to be in enclosed spaces. We're less likely to um, be um, uh, in inside. You know, being outside is actually a huge advantage to not not promoting the transmission. Um, so that that's part of why in the fall it's going to become really complicated because the typical flu the typical viruses that cause flu are also going to be um, uh, manifesting like they do every season. And many, many people are going to have flu symptoms. Now, flu sy symptoms are not good uh, and they actually do kill a lot of people. And until recently, not too many people actually focus on the fact that lots of folks die from influenza around the world. Um, the issue is, um, in this case, that we're not going to be able to tell from symptoms that you are likely to have coronavirus and then screen for it because you'll have the flu. And if you have the flu, it doesn't mean you don't have coronavirus. You could be carrying the virus and be manifesting symptoms of the virus that are being masked by another infection simultaneously. So you could think because they test you and you test positive for, say, influenza A, that you have influenza A, but you might have influenza A and also have coronavirus. A double whammy that you definitely don't want for sure. So, yeah. so what do we do? I mean, as, as a medical professional, what is your opinion that's the best way that we can do to keep ourselves and our families healthy from now and then also into the future until we find some type of vaccine or cure? So uh, this is a good time to bring up some myths. So you might have heard in the media, uh, disinfectants are great for surfaces and eliminating the virus from surfaces. Um, and infrared light is uh, a way to kill the virus on surfaces. It's not a way to kill it in the human body. That's ridiculous. You know, if you put bleach in somebody's lung, uh, they're going to uh, get caustic injury and be more prone to die from um, a lung infection from a, from a virus like COVID. So um, that, that's one part of it. I, I'd say the most important thing is to listen and follow the direction of epidemiologists and health departments and the CDC and the World Health Organization. So um, the concept that um, WHO, the World Health Organization, is the, responsible in any way for um, the spread of the disease is ridiculous. 
Um, if anything can be blamed, it's government and governments focused on markets and protecting markets. That's why the initial outbreak was suppressed in China. And that's why um, the young doctor, I think it was like 40, I may not have even been that old, um, who, who saw the condition, treated it, alerted his peers, alerted the local government. And of course, the local government, rather than acting in the best interest of the patient, um, sanctioned him, suppressed him. Uh, and five weeks later or so, uh, that doctor died of, uh, of COVID. Um, so <clears throat> I think that that's the spirit that we've had of um, distrusting government, distrusting uh, scientific uh, information, distrusting um, people that we are um, really beholden to. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician by training. I treat uh, all kinds of patients, um, but I'm also guided by people that specialize in understanding the rise and fall of disease, how it's transmitted, when it's likely to be a problem to um, gather uh, in, in large groups, uh, and when recommendations are that you shouldn't, or you're going to perpetuate this, then the right thing to do is to follow their advice and back off of that. Thanks, Sally. Um, I'm going to take one another question from our, our viewers, and this is from Angela. And her question is, do the antibody studies suggest it's been in the United States longer than originally thought? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Vicki? It's a little broken. That would be, do the antibody tests suggest that it's been, COVID-19 has been in the United States longer than originally thought? That's a, that's a definitely a possibility. So you can't say these things with certainty, but you can definitely uh, make the argument that more people were exposed earlier than we thought. And like I said before, that even though we know of 3 million people in the seven and a half billion in the world um, that uh, have tested positive, they could easily have gotten a mild condition. They could have resolved it. Their immune system responded to it. And now they have what's called IgG and IgM circulating in their serum. Um, unfortunately, the test that's available now to determine that fact is a very inaccurate test because although it reveals the presence of infection with coronavirus, it doesn't necessarily specifically suggest that you have been exposed to COVID-19. You could be, you could have several other coronaviruses and some of which are mild. So those may not be protective in the case that you contract COVID-2019. So it's a false sense of security that you're positive and now you won't, you'll have immune uh, protection as you do with other um, diseases that we know of like measles or mumps and rubella, et cetera. So that um, leads me to another question about, you know, who should be tested for the coronavirus? Like what should I do if I have symptoms, at what point do I decide that I need to be tested? And in Maryland, okay. where do I get tested? Right. So this is the problem with the, with the conflict of interest that we have with our current health system. So our current health system is set up on a for-profit basis. Because it's set up on a for-profit basis, the first intent is not the care of the entire community. So in the case of this type of outbreak, the problem is that selfish thinking creates a huge problem if you don't care for everyone in the community. If you don't determine the illness in, throughout the entire population, you are putting everyone in the community at risk, no matter how much money they have, no matter how great their insurance, no matter how much they can pay out of pocket. So um, this is part of the conundrum of testing. So limited tests were available early on. It is still a financial proposition. If we had all the funds dedicated to maintaining the health of the entire community society, then we would be much more like what's happening in South Korea, which is broad testing with less of a need to quarantine. Because we have limited testing, especially the specific test called the PCR test, which is just a fancy way to say that 
they look at the genes of the virus to be really specific about the one that's causing the problem. So that says you actually have specifically COVID-19. Um, because that's not available broadly, it's been limited by hierarchy. And those are the recommendations from the CDC. It's not that the CDC is full of epidemiologists that don't understand the concept that if everyone were tested, we'd be better off. If everyone had the right test, the entire country would be better off if we could do that. However, we're not set up to do that because our health system is based on markets and the ability to pay and acquire resources so that even when those resources are available, like they were available in Korea and were purchased by the government for the betterment of the entire society, um, you know, it's a little bit like, like anything else that's municipal, like our road system. So, um, or, or the fire department. Um, it, it's not going to be underfunded because everybody knows that, you know, you don't, you don't protect the house next to you, no matter what their ability to pay, you're, you're going to, your house is going to burn down as well. Yeah. And, and I think there are a lot of, I mean, I, I know you're a big advocate for um, improved Medicare for all and a single payer system. And that's been a lot of work that you've done. Um, you know, there are other factors I'm sure as far as, uh, my question would be, how much of an impact does it have that we have workers in low paying jobs that have no sick leave? Um, they're being told to go to work. And if they don't go to work, in some cases they're undocumented, they couldn't even get um, unemployment insurance. So, you know, how much of that is also something that we're seeing in the US because of this differential of people can afford healthcare and people who can't? compared to another country where they're looking at the holistic system as a whole. Yeah, I, I, would, I would include the entire workforce is under a stress that um, I haven't seen in my career um, and a few people have. So um, I, I think that, um, and, by, and by the way, I say that because we in America have been protected from a lot of things that, um, you know, uh, less uh, affluent, countries can't afford to defend themselves against. Like smallpox and um, malaria persisted in Africa long past the time that we had the knowledge and ability to stop it from killing millions of people. So, um, uh, you know, smallpox having been eradicated in, 80, in 1980, that was the result of a lot of investment and a lot of support for things like the World Health Organization. Um, so the the thing that you, that you touch upon is that, or that I'd like to be very careful of is to not other, right? So part of the reason we're doing this podcast is because, you know, left of their own devices, people that like plead that, you know, uh, common sense and uh, your gut and your instinct uh, are ways to deal with um, the type of challenge that, uh, the type of scientific challenge that a medical emergency like this is causing. You, know, you think about people that are, that have, um, you know, the lowest wages in America that are now out of work because they're not essential, but you also have two ridiculous extremes with the most um, educated people that are taking care of those people that are in most critical need. So you have physicians that are either being compelled to work and risk their lives and nurses and others in the healthcare system. At the same time, as you're having a shortage or firing physicians and nurses in areas where the need isn't as great. So it's a complex conundrum. Most people don't take this into account, but the people that we call doctors and the people that, that come to the fore to defend the status quo who have MDs are not the doctors in emergency departments or the doctors in your primary care office. They're not your family practitioner. They're not even your obstetrician. You know, the people that are arguing that, you know, Canada is a horrible place to work and that, you know, Great Britain has a horrible medical system. Look, doctors are coming over here to do plastic surgery is because elective plastic surgery isn't 
critical medicine in this kind of scenario. And this is when we know what, what, what we should be considering a doctor or a nurse. When people are going day after day into work, risking their life, taking care of people, or they're being told, get out, we don't need you, you're a surplus because now patients aren't coming to the hospital for non-essential reasons. That's the biggest hypocrisy in our health system is how it's inappropriately used. And patients are given the idea that it's going to solve everything. You know, it doesn't. Um, but when you're, when you're suffocating and uh, you, you need to be on life support, well, then you have no choice. Um, so those places are getting overwhelmed and they, they're severely understaffed. And those people are taking a tremendous risk and they're not getting uh, hazard pay or they're just told, hey, you know, this is what you signed up for. So good luck. Meanwhile, Administrators of hospitals have suppressed a lot of the information and, in fact, protect their market share. Um, there's a pretty um, reliable report. Um, it's on, uh, available on NPR. And it's in the New York Times. Uh, and you know how those have been vilified by a current administration. But um, the CDC set up a study understand, in, the, in the winter, set, understanding that this was coming, and asked major hospitals in six major cities to sponsor and get, participate in testing uh, suspicious patients and then reporting it so that we knew how fast it was increasing. They refused to do that. Only one actually did. And they suppressed the names because, um, well, because of the, uh, the impact that it would have to their market, which is what they were protecting in the first place. So that is untenable, right? But the CDC knew this. It's very similar to what happened to that uh, Chinese doctor, which is scientists had information and it was suppressed because it interfered with normal business as usual. And um, it, it's speculated, um, it's, it's calculated by epidemiologists that had he been adhered, had, had China adhered to the recommendations of that physician in China, when he made the recommendation, he would have saved 90% of the people that died of COVID and, and his life was already, I mean, he was already down going down a bad path because he was going to continue to treat pH patients and he probably already had contracted it. But, um, but what's deeply sad is um, the herd. And by the way, I, I do believe that, that uh, China is now not over mis you know, like misrepresenting uh, what's going on now. They took such ridiculous austere measures that in the United States of America, we would have never gone for it. I mean, in Wuhan, people were sealed into their apartments. That's not the kind of thing that we, we can do in a free country, right? Um, but um, just, to, just to suggest, this is not an othering. This is not pointing fingers. Um, and, you know, zoonotic infections being another issue, we'll, we'll get back to that. But um, the bottom line is, uh, there, there needs to be attention paid to the scientists, not the folks that are that are protecting shareholders' interests. I agree. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we have another question. I'm going to uh, to hear from Meg. Uh, Meg's asking if you could have the W the White House press corps ask a question or make a statement from you as an MD. What would that be? Wow, how much time do I have? Well, the last I, one I, I was can't even. <laughs> I got to be honest. I mean, if you if you want to see a, a good question and answer exchange on a regular basis, watch Cuomo's uh, Andrew Cuomo's briefings. Um, there's so many questions. I, I mean, um, just I don't even know where to begin. We have an inherently unjust medical system. How do you explain that in Washington, D.C. alone, 50% of all cases of COVID positive patients are African Americans? 80% of everybody that's died of COVID in Washington, D.C. is African American. There are such problems with disparity that I have to say that I would, I would start there because the, the injustice is just uh, ridiculous. It's a, it's a sense of like, 
well, it's not affecting me, so why should I worry about it? Um, and unfortunately, that's been too much of the flavor of the White House. On the other hand, I think of it, if you ask this, uh, you'd be immediately shut down or ignored because, um, you know, it'd be one of those, you know, uh, realities that they don't, they don't want to face. Right. Yeah. Sad, but true. Um, I know there's been an attack on science since the very beginning of this administration. And um, you know, we're seeing that in ter have terrible consequences now. Um, and the press. What's that? And the press. And the press. Yeah. The yeah, press. exactly. Yeah. Because the free um, press is how we know. The free press is how we know when uh, the, the, the scientific entities aren't behaving the way they should. Yeah. Well, and there are not a lot of doctors like you that are invited to talk about how, you know, we shouldn't have this for-profit medical system in the country. So thank you for standing up. Okay. I also want to plug the Arundel Patriot here. We are nonprofit. We take donations uh, and we're trying to survive and give some kind of journalism to this community. And we want to really want to ramp that up. So if you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, which is arundelpatriot.org. So that's a little plug for us. Um, let me go to another question here that I have, Ellie, um, Dr. Gomez. How long do sick patients, oh no, no let's go back here. I missed one. What, what's the treatment? So yeah, so that's, it's complicated to um, make sense out of what we're hearing in the media, and especially uh, when the president um, speaks essentially out of turn with regard to treatment. So there are no specific treatments for COVID-19. There are none. There is no vaccine yet. There is no antibiotic. Um, that's a particular, um, that's a common mistake to make that the public makes. But the public didn't go to medical school. That's not, that's not, that's not a, uh, a knock on the, the general public. Viruses uh, are, are not treated with antibiotics because antibiotics are for treating bacteria. So um, anti-inflammatories, experimental uh, treatments such as um, the um, anti-inflammatories that have been tested are, are not completely understood. It's possible they may have some value in some people it's clear that they can have lethal repercussions. So don't try to acquire some, you know, snake oil salesman's version of this is the solution. Um, it's not. Um, what we have is what we always start with in medicine. It's what we started with when we, did, we found HIV, supportive care, supportive care. And unfortunately, that's woefully inadequate and folks are still dying. Um, locally, I gotta say that we've done amazingly well um, in this area, but that's only because the tragedy hit other areas first and we followed models to turn it back. Um, I am positive that if they, you see, you, see you, you, you go against the things that have caused uh, it to slow down in Maryland and in DC, um, that we'll see a, a resurgence of the disease. Um, that the, the, the short answer again is there is no specific treatment right now, as of now. Okay. Well, that's a little discouraging, but I probably what we all knew. Um, another question here from one of our viewers, uh, what type of symptoms do people show and can do people have different symptoms that they manifest? Yeah. The answer to that is they can have a lot of different symptoms. And the ones that we've focused on to try to screen patients as higher risk and lower risk are if you've got a cough, if you're sneezing, if you have a sore throat, if you have abdominal pain and diarrhea. Um, those, are, those are things that are indicating you should be tested. Um, the other part of that is there's a reason why uh, we as a society made um, getting a medical degree hard. Yeah, you, you got to get an undergraduate degree, then you got to go to medical school, 
then you got to do a residency. Um, it's because it's not a simple matter, right? And when diseases like this take hold, they can affect your kidney and they can affect your heart. And you might think you just have a cold, but you end up with something like myocarditis, which is an inflammatory process of your whole heart. And that can kill you. Or you can have an infection that affects your kidney. And then you have failure of your kidneys or your liver. So again, those are things that if you have symptoms and you aren't feeling well, then that's a reason to seek medical advice. And I don't mean medical advice from just anybody. I mean, go find your physician who did all that time uh, in order to get the degree, not your dermatologist, because they don't want to deal with this, not your psychiatrist, although there's a whole lot of depression and anxiety going on. Uh, which is a whole nother topic. Um, but if you have illness like cough, cold, sore throat, um, shortness of breath, um, chest pain and diarrhea or abdominal pain that's severe along with one or two of those others. And I'm, I failed to mention fever, but it's absolutely true that if you have fever in the context of all these things, um, it, it's, it's incredibly, um, it's very indicative, right? If you have several of those, symptoms and a fever, that's, that's really um, suggestive that you have the infection. Dr. Gomez, I missed that last thing that you said on the list. If you have... Fever? Fever, oh, high temperature. High fever. Well, it, along the lines of the sort of medically or, or um, psychologically induced, I have to say, I'm not super hypochondriac person, but when this first happened, I literally felt like I couldn't breathe. And I, I didn't have any other symptoms, but I think a lot of us are really on edge. And, you know, how do we know what we're not, what we're having is not just, a, you know, sort of a panic attack due to all the stress that we're under. Well, here, here's the thing. So there you are at home. I suppose you're quarantined. You're a writer. I'm hoping you're quarantined and safe. Um, I'm going into our clinic as a medical director with a staff of about, I don't know, 50 to 100 people. Um, and they are screening patients for the <laughs> disease. Can you imagine what it's like when you have to sort of gather yourself? You don't want to upset the patient. But if there's a possibility, then you've got to take precautions and you have to isolate that patient in a kind and pro professional manner, which is really stressful for people. Also, some of these people have elderly parents at home, uh, family at home. Some of them have children. Some of them have had, uh, you know, their, their infant just turned a year and they no longer qualify for an exception. So they're being asked to continue to work. Um, the, the complexity of the, of the stress and the panic uh, to uh, medical workers is huge. And uh, yeah, and to the general public is very real. So there's, um, there's a lot of resources and I could um, maybe link them or pass them on to you to put on the, uh, the site um, that are good resources for um, psychological support and um, help with the stress and depression really. Um, the other part of this, of course, being that apart from the stress about the disease, the stress is like being isolated. Just being isolated is, is, is a problem in our society already. So um, if on top of that, we're being asked to be uh, deliberately isolated, a lot of people don't have the tools to handle that. So we've got to be ready to have a system or, or resources to help people um, with that need. Sorry, my cat is out of control over here. Um, what, what, but, are um, your, your tricks? What, do you, what tricks do you have up your sleeve to keep your sanity with dealing with that? the doctor every day? Well, one of the things is this. So I communicate, um, you know, that occasionally I'll, I'll put out um, my um, sort of take on what's going on in healthcare particularly, um, but just uh, social political injustice in general, as I see it, um, is a way to connect with people. Um, I, I try to work with people that are doing that kind of work now and support them. 
like our friend Yaz, who's on the call as well. Um, and, um, and stay in touch with friends, you know, stay connected, check in with them, uh, asking to make sure that they're okay is incredibly helpful to, um, reassure you that you're okay. Um, it's almost like, uh, you know, um, seeing your reflection. And, um, I think those things are helpful. Um, I think when you're down or you're feeling isolated, reach out, talk to people, have some trusted people that you're close to that, you know, maybe asymptomatic, um, your partner, your child, um, stay connected, stay in touch, uh, do things, do things outdoors that, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily fly to California and sit on a beach right now, but, um, find less crowded places to walk or hike, go running and get a, get on a bike. It's a great time to get outside. I have never seen this many friendly runners, hikers, bikers. I've never seen so many people wave from six feet away ever. You might have <laughs> and and, I, and I, I've been, I've been into running and, and all that for a long while now. And uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's actually, uh, it, it, it inspires you. It makes you feel good that, you know, people are saying, Hey, you know, I, I know it's tough and, and uh, I'm here with you. Yeah, that does help. I know that um, there's a park behind Annapolis High School near where I live, and it's just a forest. I feel so much better if I could spend an hour in that forest and come back home and go back to isolation. <laughs> um, I have another question from one of our viewers. Uh, the question is, my daughter is sick, and I want to go see her, but she says no. Should I go or not? It's well, not, not she hasn't been diagnosed with uh, COVID, but she has some symptoms. So the first thing I would say is, how often are you usually around your daughter and how far are you traveling? Right. Mm. That's one thing. And the other part that I would say is that if um, this mom, for instance, is um, 70 and her daughter is 35, um, I would say she should listen to her daughter. Um, if we're talking about, um, a, a mother with a young child, that's a lot more complicated, especially if that child is in need of, of comfort. Um, but it's still true that if there's another caretaker or that individual is able to care for themselves, this is not the right time. Um, uh, Skype, uh, zoom meet with your mom, um, be supportive in other ways. I check in with my mother every day, every other day, at least. And, um, you know, via text and send pictures. Um, but what you're doing, what you're, what you're doing is actually, she's protecting you. She's protecting you from a risk of death. So somebody, let's say um, his, her daughter gets better, but how long should she sort of remain in isolation or try to remain as quarantined as possible for other friends or family members or people that she even, I, I know people are trying to be in one room or a basement. A, a lot of people don't have that much space or it's more open. Like what are, what are the guidelines for how long a sick patient getting better would need to be isolated? So the CDC uh, uh, publishes um, guidelines for how to handle that, that question. And, um, the most recent advice is unless you have been fever and symptom free for 72 hours without using Tylenol and Motrin to keep your fever down, um, you're not a candidate at all. If you are symptom free for 72 hours with that, with that, all, that all those criteria met, but it's been less than seven days, you should not go out. So it's got to be more than seven days. It's got to be 72 hours. And I would add that the typical quarantine that's recommended the 14 days, I think that that's a reasonable time. Um, I think some people are being asked to go back to work after seven days. Personally, I would argue that 14 days is, uh, is sort of min minimal. Um, and when you go back, you're going to go back to whatever work environment you are and you're going to be wearing a mask uh, to ensure you're not transmitting disease. 
and certainly that you're lowering the risk of you yourself uh, contracting it again, because there's no, like I said, there's no guarantee that you can't. All right, so we're live here in Arundel Patriot. We're asking for your questions. So question away, viewers, share our posts, uh, like the Arundel Patriot page so you'll get updates because we plan on doing a lot more of these. So I'm gonna continue asking uh, some of my questions while we wait for you guys to chime in. Um, one of the questions I, ha I had were like, how many people have been affected with COVID overall globally? So the numbers in Maryland as well. As much as I as I look at these numbers every day, I I actually try to put them out of my head. I swear to God, um, there's there's been um, you know three million affected. I said before, um, eight hundred seventy five thousand people have recovered which is a really great number. Um, and about uh, 207,000 have died around the world. Um, in the US, we've had about a million people affected and over 100,000 recovered, but 55,000, more than 55,000 have died. So um, it's not trivial, but it's, it's, not, it's not a time for making crazy remarks like uh, more people die in accidents or, uh, our um, resident celebrity doctor, Dr. Oz, uh, suggesting that if we open schools, uh, we might only lose two to three percent of the population of, um, of students. It's it's that type of irresponsible. I mean, he's not an epidemiologist. He's a retired cardiothoracic surgeon, and really, what he is, he's a celebrity. He's not been practicing for for over a decade. So, so yeah, it's significant numbers of people have died. Um, it's slowed tremendously. Um, most folks know that Seattle's our outbreak has, has calmed down quite a bit and that the curve in New York state, which saw over 16,000 deaths has now flattened and the rate of uh, disease and the number of deaths has gone down, has, has stopped increasing. So um, the caveat being that it's not over, um, and it, if it's slowing down, that's great. But this is not a time for us to uh, to you know let our guard down. So speaking of us, most of us are in Maryland. We're the Arundel Patriot, but hopefully we have people. Oh, from my I know my parents are watching because they always are supportive of me. They're out in California. Hi, mom and dad. Um, if I, I feel very. I feel very safe being in Maryland relatively. I think um, uh, a lot of people have given a lot of kudos to our governor and our local um, politicians uh, and everybody seems to be pretty compliant to wanting to stay safe. Why do you think some places are doing better than others, especially Maryland? Specifically? Yeah, well, that's a complex problem, you know, issue. So there's, there's a lot of different things that happen. And, and like I said before, part of, part of the problem is that if you have a metropolitan area with 8.3 million people, um, you, you're really, your, t your quarters are so tight. Your, your, um, your social distance is not six feet. Um, you can't function in New York City without mass travel. Most people can't, couldn't have functioned in New York City in March, uh, February. Um, they, they weren't yet quarantined. Uh, or being told to stay home or furloughed or et cetera. Um, they were riding subways. They were, right, and, and, and New York is 8.3 million people. Um, Baltimore, to give you sort of a relative, it's like 600,000. Greater metropolitan DC is like 700,000. Um, you know, of course, we're going to be uh, at an advantage from the standpoint of just space, but. Um, but beyond that, like I said, it the the spread went so fast in other areas, especially Seattle, took a huge hit, and that's not surprising because travel to and from Asia in the in the Northwest is uh, is is you know far exceeds anywhere else in the states. So the fact that the Seattle Sound was just devastated early, uh, and and then following shortly after that, New York. Um, that helped our situation because we saw their tragedy and said, oh my God, we better do something. So 
Sorry, I'm on my computer. Yeah. I realized I'm not plugged in. <laughs> okay, you're like you're like your own cat. <laughs> my, own my, cat. cat. <laughs> my cat was trying to eat Cordia. He's usually like right here, trying to get in my way and get on screen. Um, so we have another question uh, from a viewer. Laura is asking, I have a family member who has to fly on Wednesday. What safety measure would you advise him to take? Where is your family member flying and is it essential? Otherwise I would say, stay put, do not fly. Um, my first thought with regard to anything that isn't critical right now is it seems like we're not doing anything by staying home, um, but it's a lot. What you're doing is you're lowering your own risk and you're lowering the risk to other people. So um, yeah, unless that person's flying one way to their home, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyone um, doing that at this point right now. And, and what about plane etiquette to stay safe? I know that um, I had visited China about five years ago and seen a lot of people wearing masks in public, public transportation. And after that, I started wearing masks on the plane. Um, but even as I flew back here from California in the beginning of March wearing a mask and almost no one was, I, what, what would you suggest as far as wiping everything down around you? You know, do you, have, you know, in the old days we would say, you yeah. could, you can't, do enough. you can't you can't you can't do enough i mean it seems crazy but you cannot do enough um if you don't mind getting a cold on a on a cross-continental trip don't don't bother with a mask um but the reason why that happens so often is because you have recirculated recirculated air every every one of those people on that plane is breathing the same air and uh uh, heaven forbid somebody should cough, because if you cough, uh, the spread is um, obvious when somebody, say, sneezes. It's a little less subtle. Um, you say you think that this thing uh, spreads about oh, 10, 20 feet, and then the large droplets fall, fall to the ground. But actually, there's good studies now that show that in poorly circulated air, in enclosed spaces, the particles just stay there in the air <laughs> for a minimum of 20 minutes every time you have a cough or a sneeze. So um, in, a, in a plane, you can imagine that that's just, that's, that same air is gonna get recirculated. If you, if you were able to open a window, you're, you'd, you'd be fine, but that's not happening in the 30,000 feet. <laughs> don't open a window. That was not the yeah, advice. Don't, don't be no. Dr. R. Um, so uh, we have a little bit of time here. I have a couple more questions. Um, I think you talked about uh, some of these things already that I was planning on asking you, but I think it's, wor it's worth going back to. You know, talk about it, is COVID-19 affecting all communities equally? Why and why not? Yeah. So the why not is, is complex, but it's worth saying a couple of things about it that are uh, immediately obvious to me. So because of the historic relationship that um, people of color have had with um, institutionalized medicine, um, there is a, there's a baseline distrust there's a problem with that, right? So, so if there's a baseline distrust, when you're sick, you, you, might, get, you might stay home. But when, when you get sicker and are most desperate, that's when you actually go for care. Whereas if you trust the system, you're gonna show up pretty early on and say, hey, what's going on here? Get tested, get found to be affected, get whatever you need to be uh, the recommendation to be isolated. And now you haven't passed that on to your family members. Add to that all these other confounding problems, right? So if you are an immigrant and uh, you know, you're doing your job, you continue to go to work and you're providing, uh, you know, fruit and vegetables for us to, to eat because we all needed to survive. Um, 
you know, my, that's what the situation migrant workers are in. And so they don't want to go to attention because they go to go to attention and they risk being deported. They know that. Um, the other the other thing, there are cultural differences, right? We we don't tend to have, um, uh, you know, we tend to be closer physically. Um, people of color and our families tend to be closer. We tend to associate more. Um, we, we tend to be a little hard-headed about advice and distrust advice from sources like the CDC. Um, social distancing isn't a thing that's just like natural to us. Um, I, I got to tell you just candidly, um, that's obvious to me because I, in the last week, I've had patients with STDs. They're not getting those at a distance. Um, they're, you know, the, those habits are also, um, in other times, they're life sustaining or they're psychologically, um, uh, stabilizing and, and fulfilling. So people don't move away from those relationships just because the government says, Hey, don't, don't touch each other or et cetera. Um, and then it depends on who's telling you that, right. And what your habits are, um, and it can work in it can work in different ways. I mean, there's a lot of um, white, uh, especially um, Christian churches in the South, that have had outbreaks because they refuse to stop holding services. Um, and and a number of um, ministers have died uh, in that in that um, you know going with that behavior. Clearly, isolating helps. It reduces your risk. Um, and unfortunately, if you're in large metropolitan areas, it's harder to reduce your risk. But remember, it's much harder to reduce your risk if you don't have a vehicle, if you use public transportation, if you work um, in fast food industry, as opposed to uh, you know, you're, you're a consultant or you're an accountant, um, you know, um, those types of, um, endeavors and, and everybody, right. It's got to, got to work to eat. Right. Well, there's a bunch of people in the community, the, the clinic that I'm director for is in the middle of one of, our one of the poor, uh, black neighborhoods in DC. And, uh, it's a really beautiful facility, by the way, but, um, but it's in a, in a poor community. And um, the if you step out, you see at, around lunchtime, you see tons of people around in parking lots. And you know, what the heck is all this? Well, they're, they're Uber Eats and they're Lyft drivers bringing food to those that can just stay isolated. So they, the risk is being taken by the people that are contracting the condition. And... Um, and that's just how it is in, a, in the hierarchy, uh, you know, in a in a economic hierarchy, you can somewhat protect yourself from from exposure. That's that's definitely another contributor. All right. Well, it's almost uh, seven thirty, but we got a little bit of a late start, so I'm going to take one more question from our viewer D. Uh, her question is: I have an elderly parent who lives alone. I visit her approximately twice a week. During each visit, I wear a face mask and disposable gloves. She wears a mask also. We don't touch. Is this safe? It sounds like you're doing all the right things. And it sounds like you're supporting uh, your family member in the best way you can. I think in that case, it's kind of almost, uh, you know, the advice that I gave to the well mom with the well younger uh, child, um, uh, or, you know, and I presume adult, I don't know if we ever got the answer to that, but um, in, in this case, uh, where you have an elderly parent that you're caring for and you're doing it in such a responsible way, I can't uh, commend you enough for the way that you just described how you're doing that, because that's, that's what I would do. That's excellent. In fact, uh, I want to thank my brother and sister-in-law because they're doing that for my parents right now. Um, and uh, I know they're taking every precaution. And my dad said, you know, your brother came in here and he's wearing a hazmat suit and 
And, um, but I think, you know, it's so important that we take care of the people who are most vulnerable. But, you know, it's, it's not about being comfortable anymore, you know, going to the store and it's, you know, wow, this is what medical people have to wear all day long, you know, and so, um, you know, I just, I think it's kind of, you know, there are silver linings to this that I think in a lot of ways it has brought people together. Ah, sorry. <laughs> so many things to learn about. Um, but anyway, I, I really think, I really appreciate you being here, Dr. Gomez. I hope everybody got a lot out of this. Um, I hope you shared this live stream and you continue to share. I hope you stay watching Rundle Patriot because I'm definitely going to have Dr. Gomez back on. Um, I think there's a, a bunch more topics that I've always really um, been so interested in that he's talked about. And uh, I know he loves to share. He's a great teacher. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being a great teacher. And thanks for the work. I think it's a little bit out of desperation because I want to make sure somebody hears me so I bug you about it. <laughs> All right, we're going to hear him. Um, go to rundlepatriot.org to donate and help us continue to give you great journalism and things that aren't covered in other places. Have a good awesome. night. Good night. Hi, good <laughs> <job>. <laughs> we'll get better.